It is Tuesday. That's right, all you mentees. That means it's time to take an advanced look at all these trades coming out this week from Marvel Comics. So let's get started. Now, before getting started, I want to give a huge thank you to David Gabriel and the fine folks at Marvel for sending us advanced copies of these trades. These trades are all due out in the direct market and book market on March 3rd and 4th, depending on where you get your books. As always, I put timestamps in the description of the video to kind of guide you in case you want to skip something or you don't want to be completely spoiled about anything in a particular book or series. So if you want to jump down there in the description of the video is where you're going to find the timestamps. It's also where you're going to find a link to our Patreon and our spread shop. Those are great ways to support the channel if you can do so. All right, so we have a lot to talk about. So let's go ahead and talk about these Mighty Marvel Masterworks. So here we have the Mighty Marvel Masterworks Avengers Volume 2. My kids just wrapped up Daredevil Volume 1, so can't wait to do a review on that with them. Uh, here is the back of the direct market cover, which of course has the classic cover. And then the back of the standard edition cover by Michael Cho there. Uh, both of these books retail for $15.99, and of course they have different spines. Uh, they both have 216 pages. Let's take a closer look at this. Uh, and then these collect issues 11 through 20 of the Avengers. Here's all the credits, Don Heck, Jack Kirby, Stan Lee, Larry Lieber. Um, I think in this, yeah, you get the introduction of the Masters of Evil, Count Nefaria. Oh, Kang the Conqueror, heck yes. Rumored to be in one of the recent face or faces of, uh, what is it, the MCU movies. I know he appeared in a TV show. I don't want to spoil that. But anyway, uh, apparently he's also going to appear in one of the movies. So, hence uh, why it's a big deal. And I would love to see a freaking Kang the Conqueror omnibus. Uh, this also shows this, yeah, the Swordsman is here as well. Forgot about that. So, Hawkeye, Quicksilver, this is definitely the changing of the guard when Hawkeye, Quicksilver, and Scarlet Witch join the Avengers with Captain America. So, look for this in a future episode of Near Main Condition to have a more in-depth review. So, here we have Star Wars The High Republic. This is Volume 3, Jedi's End. Now, when the series first started, I've, I've done an overview of um, both Volumes 1 and 2. And when the series first started, I didn't know what to think about it yet. But man, did I end up really enjoying this series. Uh, here are all the credits. You have Kavan Scott writing the High Republic. So this collect issues 11 through 15. And then Eye of the Storm miniseries by Charles Soule. Uh, George's Genty supplying the artwork uh, for issues 11 and 12. And then Adio... And Indito doing the 13 through 15. And this is what I enjoy about it. The fact that they give you the timeline of when it takes place. Now, if you've been reading Star Wars and following the extended universe um, for years, you know, there have been books, there have been comics. And it seems like they kind of put a stop to that. Uh, but first, let's look at this really quick. So you have the High Republic here. It does take place before the Fall of the Jedi, which is the beginning of the Fall, uh, the Phantom Menace. Uh, not not as like far off like uh, the Old Republic, where we were talking like 20,000 plus years before the beginning of Episode 1. Uh, quite, not, not quite that far off. Like I think it's closer, like 200 years or so. Then we have the Reign of the Empire, which I love that they put in the most recent movies, right? Like the Bad Batch and a Star Wars story solo. Age of Rebellion, here's where you'll have the Rogue One, Episode 4, 5, and 6. And then the New Republic. I love that the Mandalorian is there. That's so awesome. And of course, Rise of the First Order, which is the 7, 8, and 9. Here we have Jedi's End, Chapter 1, Only Fear. And what I was going to say about this is, I didn't know what to think about it. And the reason I did end up enjoying it has a lot to do with the fact that I read the old uh, Knights of the Old Republic omnibus and I think I was just tired of the whole Skywalker saga I needed a break from it and since Disney Marvel acquired the rights back for Star Wars um, we haven't really had that right we've had Star Wars by Jason Aaron kicking it off we've had uh, Poe Dameron Princess Leia series Darth Vader having multiple series 
Um, oh, but there was that one series. But anyway, I wanted to read something about characters that haven't existed for a long time. And that's what I missed. Back when the Jedi's, you know, the Republic was all good and everything was peaceful. And then, you know, before the formation of the Sith or the return of the Sith. So uh, that's the kind of stories that I miss reading. And it wasn't until I read that that I'm like, oh, man, I think this is more my cup of tea. You don't need to know anything about Star Wars universe to enjoy these. I mean, it helps, of course. And the other thing I was going to say is that they were really pushing for these. These came out with books audiobooks, manga, uh, kids' stories, young adult novels. Like, they were really pushing for this series. And that's just phase one. And now we have to wait. I think it starts later on this year, phase two. And I don't know when it's going to take us from here. Like, if it's going to be uh, immediately after this, or if it's going to be, like, 200 more years into the future, 100 more years into the future. I can't imagine going backwards, but... I'm a little upset about that because now I have to wait. I love this, by the way. Here you really get to see this character of Av Avar Chris, Marshall Avar Chris, just go full out. And I guess it makes sense that I'm doing this right before May 4th. Uh, but this does feel like an ending to a series, even though it, does, it just states the end, a new beginning or something like that. Um, so yes, here you'll see pretty much what ends up happening to the entire crew as they're being attacked by this Nihil. Uh, with they, they've been dealing with that since the very first issue. And I love her path of justice and what she thinks is right. Like she's trying to bring Lorna D to justice, but not everybody really agrees with that. Uh, you, and you, you see what happens to Skier. This is in a big <laughs> spoiler or anything. And you get to see how Keith Trennis is dealing with the ramifications of what she just witnessed in, well, in the previous volume. So that's all I will say about that. The interesting thing about this is that in the back is where they collect this story called um, The High Republic. And this is The Eye of the Storm. And it's a story about the uh, the character of Mar Marcian Cho. Ro. Marcian Ro. Maybe that's how you pronounce it. These Star Wars names, I swear. And how he ends up getting this weapon to destroy the Jedi. So, pretty interesting story here. Uh, it's only two issues. And I guess that if they were going to put it somewhere... It does feel a little uh, weird to read it after everything. But I guess it makes sense. Because otherwise it would have spoiled some things. As far as the extras in the back. We do have the variant covers back here. But you also saw some variants. Like that Peach Momoko uh, variant of Avar. Uh, whenever I was flipping through there. But some of the other variants are back here. The book has 192 pages and retails for $19.99. Then we have some thumbnail variants there and other Star Wars books. So um, I'm sure the question that I'm going to get is, do you need to have read the book, the audiobook, the manga to enjoy this? I haven't read any of that, but my buddy Matty tells me, Wonder Matty, says that it will enhance your experience for sure. How did I not know about this book? So you have Al Ewing teaming up with Javier Rodriguez, and man, they bring the Defenders back. But it's not like a Defenders team that you've seen before. Because, um, you know, the Defenders have always been a team that kind of just get put together because things and crap is just falling apart. So they're like, hey, guys want to, like, uh, team up? Yeah, sure, let's do it. Uh, but you do have the classic Silver Surfer character and Doctor Strange, and then some new faces here, like uh, Red Harpy and Cloud back there. Though Cloud has been a part of it in the past. But you do have a new character of Taya joined the team, and well, let's let's get there because who is this character right here? Who is this Mask Raider that is coming uh, to tell Doctor Strange about this impending doom that is heading towards Earth and is going to destroy it? Of course, Doctor Strange is like, yo. Okay, let's. I guess we'll put a team together. We'll use tarot cards this time to put a team together of defenders. So it's really interesting to see how these characters all work together. I mean, we have Red Harpy, who has been around, but in case you don't know who the character is, I'll just leave it at that. Red Harpy. You have Cloud, who has been with the defenders in the past. And then you have this character here of Taya, who is a strange type of character. And I don't mean that as a play on words she's just an interesting character and she does have a secret uh now you also get to see this thing called the omnimax now for omni collectors that's a really badass name but 
it's not what you think. It's kind of creepy in the beginnings of something bigger than what it really is. So, yes, the Masked Raider helps Doctor Strange form this new team. And he himself has a secret. So we're not going to talk about that. But I thought that that was a really interesting twist. What I want to showcase the most, though, is Javier Rodriguez's artwork. I love his stuff. And ever since I was spoiled by the Treasury edition of the History of the Marvel Universe, I hope that everything that he makes eventually makes it into a big Treasury or Gallery edition. Because his art deserves to be an oversized format. I think he is a phenomenal artist. And the flow of his panels, even though they get crazy sometimes, oh my gosh, they kind of mimic a little bit of like Steve Ditko. So I guess when you're dealing with Doctor Strange, you do want to show or throw some love at Steve Ditko for the insanity that his panels were. Um, but yes, uh, this is collecting the five-issue uh, miniseries. Sadly, I think it's just a miniseries. I would love to see the Defenders return again in a monthly uh, format, but I don't know if that's going to happen or not. 144 pages. It retails for $15.99. Let's look at the extras in the back. Oh, and all the way in the back, you also get from the Marvel 1000 comic in 1001, uh, the Al Ewing stories where he teamed up with different character, or characters, or he teamed up with different artists to bring stories uh, of just different characters throughout the Marvel universe. And this is where you're going to see the return of the Masked uh, Raider, which was a character from Marvel Comics number one. So he decided to bring him back through these pages. Uh, man, I'd love to see the Agents of Atlas one day. Al Ewing should just be writing a lot. Uh, but then we also have extras in the back here. Uh, you get this, okay, this is really cool because in one issue, of course, they go through different dimensions, and this is the fourth cosmos, uh, where they, you know, actually make contact and they encounter these characters that obviously are based on characters he, uh, from the 616 universe. Here are some variants in the back, including one here by Ron Lim, and some thumbnail variants. Rob Liefeld, Doctor Strange there. Uh, the book, like I mentioned, has 144 pages and retails for $15.99. Speaking of a series that should be always there in monthly format, X-Men Legends. This is volume two of X-Men Legends. This one is called Mutant Mayhem. Um, you have a cover here by Dan Jurgens. He's not the only creator in here. These are the type of stories that these wonderful creators um, from the 80s and 90s go back and kind of plug in some holes that you, um, you may have missed or didn't even know about. So I'll use a couple of examples. I swear I'm not going to spend the entire time doing this book. I know we have a lot of other books to look at. Okay, so you have issue number seven here which features Wolverine and Kitty Pryde, not Kitty Pryde, Jubilee, already messing it up. This one's written by Larry Hama, and I love the fact that they teamed him up with Billy Tan. It has a very similar style to Mark Silvestri. It's very important to note that this story takes place prior to Wolverine 69. So 68 was the Epsilon Red story. Uh, I think that's the final Mark Texaria issue. And then issue 69 is the Savage Land story where Rogue, um, Wolverine, and Jubilee go to the Savage Land. This story right here features a bunch of characters that previously have fought against each other. And one thing I noticed about Billy Tan's artwork, it's changed a little bit. He has a very, um, looks a little more anime-ish than what I'm used to. Because I was used to his sketchy style and looking like uh, Mark Silvestri. As a matter of fact, he actually drew Uncanny X-Men for a while during the Ed Brubaker Matt Fraction days. So you have the appearance of Lady Shiva, you have Omega Red, you have Sabretooth. But the best appearance I see here, besides Yukio, because it's always a pleasure to see Yukio and Larry Hama writing these characters, is this character right here, Birdie. Oh, I love that character. I thought she was so underused. Has she come back in Krakoa? There's been so many characters that have come back, and some for no reason at all. Hashtag, bring back Birdie. Hashtag, bring back Rusty Collins. I don't think Rusty's back either. But what I was going to say is that she's back. So it's for that, it, this is definitely for that era of readers that read through the 90s that may have played the video games, because she was in the X-Men vs. Street Fighter video game when Sabretooth snaps his fingers and he was like, Birdie! Yeah, that, anyway. 
uh, something like that. And then we get a fill-in issue, not a fill-in issue, these are all fill-in issues, right? They, this is supposed to have taken place during the events, I love this, during the events of X-Men number 34. That's the issue where Beast, uh, Gambit, and Psylocke go into Sinister's house. And um, they talk about, doppel not doppelgangers, but clones. So Sinister's here, e eating with these fine people. This is drawn by Dan Jurgens, written by Fabian Uciesa. Uh, so let's skip that one so you don't get spoiled. We have Walter Simonson do a story about the Four Horsemen of Apocalypse. And you even throw Farrell in there. This is written by Louise Simonson before her actual appearance. Because this takes place before the New Mutants head over to uh, Asgard uh, during the Valkyrie storyline. So you end it with Chris Claremont. And there are variants, by the way. And it kind of give you a heads up as to who's going to appear in the story. This one's drawn by Scott Eaton. Now, see, this is a series I would love to see. So this takes place immediately after Fall of the Mutants and right before Excalibur Special Edition number one, where the Excalibur team is formed. And it brings back Hard Case and his Harriers. That's that's awesome. That was another Chris Claremont uh, militia team that appears through the pages of Uncanny. So. Technically, they would have appeared here first. I I would love this. I would love for this They just keep going. I know there's more issues coming, but I would love if they focus on things like where was Longshot during the Mutant Massacre? Little things like that. Like, I, I think it's just an interesting series. And for anybody that read X-Men, absolutely, it's the series to get, um, especially if you read it in the 80s and 90s. Uh, here is an awesome freaking variant by Carrie Andrews. So you do have variants all the way here in the back and some thumbnail variants. Uh, so this book collects issues 7 through 12 of X-Men Legends. And it's $17.99 and has 136 pages. Speaking of the 90s, next up, Spirits of Vengeance, Rise of the Midnight Suns. This is a new printing of a trade paperback that came out a few years ago. Uh, this one has 432 pages and retails for $39.99. And looking at the art in here and rereading some of these stories, why, oh, why was this never an oversized hardcover? Why don't we have a Danny Ketch Ghost Rider Omnibus? I'm sure the older generation's like, why don't we have a Johnny Blaze Ghost Rider Omnibus? And then the newer cats are like, where's the Robbie Reyes Ghost Rider Omnibus? Yet all we have is uh, Jason Aaron's Ghost Rider. Oh, no, no, wait, we do have uh, Cosmic Ghost Rider. So this is an interesting era for the Ghost Rider. We kick it off with issue number 28 of Ghost Rider, the 1990 series. So when Howard Mackey's writing the book, by now Mark Texeria has left, and it's Andy Kubert drawing issues. But it's interesting because this is when Danny Ketch, who's the host of the spirit of vengeance that possesses him, is kind of indisposed. He is, uh, how do I put it? He is no longer sticking around here. On this plane of existence, if you will. So it's just Ghost Rider that's riding around, just the spirit of vengeance. And speaking of Ghost Rider, there we have Johnny Blaze. He's back and he's teaming up with Ghost Rider to help put the demons down. I love this era. So Johnny Blaze no longer has the Zarathos demon in him, he just has the Hellblazer gun. Love this. So this also collects Ghost Rider 31. Uh, and this helps to kick off new series. So you have the Spirits of Vengeance, one through six is collected in here. Morbius, the 1992 series, issue number one. Darkhold, pages from the uh, Book of Sins, number one. Night Stalkers, number one. And then they also included the Web of Venom storyline in here with uh, Web of Spider-Man, 95 and 96. And then material from Midnight Suns, Unlimited, number one. Look at that. Again, Andy Kubert just kicking all kinds of ass. I love the Night Stalkers. I love these characters. I love this era of... Ghost Rider. I mean, this is when I was just making my own money. You know, the, I didn't have a full-time job. I just had a job, like, after school or part-time or working at factories or working, at, like I mentioned, like, in tobacco fields whenever I do the Saturday live stream. So this is how I would spend my money, and Marvel would get me. Oh, it's a number one issue, and it comes in a poly bag? Done. I'm getting it. I'm getting, Sometimes I would get two copies because, you know, I was going to get rich doing that. Um... But you have a lot of talent in here because, you know, you have Andy Kubert on Ghost Rider. 
And that is part one of the, uh, what's it called? I'm sorry, The Rise of the Midnight Suns. Um, and then you have Adam Kubert, his brother, on Spirits of Vengeance. Now that's awesome. Um, you have Joe Kubert, their father, inking some of Andy's stuff and some of Adam's stuff in here. Uh, you have the return of Morbius. And also, this feels like, you know, you have Ron Garney. This was done on purpose, I'm sure. Uh, I'm sorry, Ron Wagner doing the artwork for this. And immediately you think, oh, that's somebody that graduated from the Kubert Art School for sure. Just the facial exp uh, expressions and the way that their panels are laid out. Yeah, see, you have some early Adam Kubert here. And there's the Darkhold book. And does Doctor Strange make an appearance? Maybe. Uh, here is the special collector's item. So this each chapter of The Rise of the Midnight Suns was sold in printed poly bag. And here's issue number one of Night Stalkers. And of course, this is part five of The Rise of the Midnight Suns. So that's how they would get people to buy new books. I mean, that gimmick is still being used today. And, of course, all of it wrapping up in Ghost Rider 31 with... I didn't even talk about what Rise of the Midnight Suns is. All right, long story short, you have the character of Lilith. She's the mother of demons, and she is coming to Earth to destroy all of humanity. So it's up to these dark forces to team up and take her down. That's it. So let's skip a little bit through here. Uh, here is the Web of Venom story arc in here. I hope I'm calling it the right thing. I seem to remember it being called... The or the spirits of venom. I'm calling him Web of Venom. Spirits of Venom. Damn it. Yes. Ugh, this old brain of mine. 432 pages retailing for 39.99. I love this. Love this. The way the angle looks. You're looking from inside of Venom's mouth and looking at what he's about to chomp on. One of my favorite covers of all time. I bought two copies of this just so I could hang one up on the wall. I love the colors. I love how menacing he looks. This is drawn by Adam Kubert. Man, these books, man, they bring back a lot of memories for me. Where I was, my town where I lived in had a, they, the comic shop closed. So there was three months I didn't have a comic shop. So I had to go and buy comics from this baseball card called uh, Fourth Base. It was called Fourth Base Cards, but he had a diamond account. No, he had a Capital City account. Uh, Capital used to also send out books back then. And they also shipped out uh, baseball cards. So I asked him if he could order some for me, and he was like, yeah. So I think there was one month that I missed my pull list, but I, I had to go. Like, I drove 30 minutes, or my mom, sorry, that was back then in 92. <laughs> my mom drove me to uh, go get comics like 30 minutes away from a comic shop. But yeah, these uh, certainly bring back memories. Now we've gotten to the part of the video where we look at the spines. So here are all the spines of the books being released from Marvel today. Pause it, mute me, do whatever it is that you need to do. But here are all the spines together. Whenever I do these overviews, I try to stay spoiler-free as much as possible. I learned my lesson. It wasn't really a learned lesson. It was just I saw that comments... Um, in, the, in one particular video, I can't even remember what it was. I do remember the story was about 35 years old or so, but people hadn't read it, so I respect that. I, you know, I try to respect my viewers as much as possible. Sometimes I can't help when things are spoiled in titles. So, apologies, <laughs> in case you didn't know. Uh, but this is Jane Foster, the saga of the mighty Thor. And I, yeah... Especially when I did my overview of Thor by Jason Aaron Omnibus, I didn't even talk about Jane Foster being Thor. But yeah, I'm sure that was spoiled already by the trailer for a lot of people. But just in case, I, I try to play it as safe as possible. So here we have Jane Foster, The Saga of the Mighty Thor. This book has 472 pages. It retails for $44.99. And it kicks off with issue number one of Thor. So he collects Thor 1 through 8. And then we get something called Secret Wars, but it's not collected in here. And this also collects Mighty Thor. So the title after Secret Wars became Mighty Thor. Issues 1 through 5, 8 through 11, and 13 and 14. And then we also have the Generations Unworthy Thor and Mighty Thor, and then material from the Thor Annual number 1. 
So you have this huge mystery leading up as to who is carrying Mjolnir, who is now Thor, because Thor, the, the guy we've been reading about, you know, since the 60s, is no longer Thor because he can't, uh, uh, he can't carry Mjolnir. And of course, the hammer's always said, whomever holds this hammer, if he be worthy, shall possess the power of Thor. So then we have a female Thor that shows up in the very last page of issue number one. And like I said, the mystery is there for a while. And of course, since the cover's here and you all know who it is, um, it kind of takes a little bit away, but not that much. Because look at this freaking artwork. Russell Dodderman just bringing the heat with his art. Guy is phenomenal. And of course, I turn to the page that he didn't draw. Um, but yes, after Secret Wars, the series kicks off again with Mighty Thor. And yeah, this is the type of art you're going to see in here. These are the characters you're going to see in here. It's just... And actually, let's go back here because I do want to show. I love showing this page. This double page spread cover right here. And I swear, no matter what collected edition, you can't see the full effect. I think the Omnibus has the best um, gutter curve out of all of them. Uh, the OHCs and the Complete Collections. But I've always loved that cover. So in here, this kicks off with Mighty Thor. So this is pretty much just the saga of Jane Foster as Thor. Uh, it doesn't follow the adventures of Odin's son, really, or the War Thor story arc. Um, but it just focuses on her wielding the hammer. And also, you know, the, the thing is that she's dying of cancer. And she knows that every time she picks up the hammer, it affects her body more. And it weakens her. So she knows that it's killing her, but she's a hero, right? So she's doing the right thing. She still picks up the hammer and goes out there and kicks ass because that's what heroes do. You do get to see uh, Malekith build his army of from uh, the different realms to, of course, set up War, War of the Realms. But if you're a completist, you know, this is one that doesn't have all the stories. But if you do have somebody that's like, oh my gosh, I love the new Thor Love and Thunder movie. Please let me know where I can go and read some more about this character. Since a lot of the books are out of print, uh, you can go the omnibus route. You gotta really like somebody if you're giving them that. There's also the Marvelverse book, which is the smaller, like $9.99 book. It's a little small, like the uh, Mighty Marvel Masterworks. Or there's this option here. And you can be like... Dude, here, read more about Thor here, and then get hooked. And for you completists, where else do you go besides something called the Complete Collection? However, that's right, there is a however in this one. All right, Thor by Jason Aaron, wrapping up his seven-year run on Thor. Volume 5. Here's what the spine looks like, but I've already shown what all the spines look like. Thor hanging out with Odin right there, drinking some beer. So this one does have a little bit of a spoiler as to what happens at the end of the Mighty Thor, but just in case, uh, yeah, if you haven't read those, you know, su please surprise yourself. You don't don't let anybody spoil it for you. I hate to be that guy, uh, but if you don't care about spoilers or you've read the stuff and you just want to get to this, welcome back. All right. So Thor by Jason Aaron, Complete Collection, Volume Five. Now we're starting over with a new Thor run because. After Jane Foster loses the ability to turn into Thor and something happens to her, you can read about it in Mighty Thor. It kind of gives you a quick catch up here. We have Odin's son, our Thor, back as Thor. He has a golden arm though. What? How? Where? And now we have Mike Del Mundo joining Jason Aaron. So it, remember when I did my overview, in case you watch all my videos, uh, of the Thor omnibus by Jason Aaron? It's like he went through three phases. He goes through the Ezad Ribic phase. He goes through the Russell Dodderman phase of Thor. And then he goes through the Mike Del Mundo phase. But then uh, Ezad Ribic, sorry, mispronounced it, um, brings him back home. So I love this because <laughs> this is Juggernaut testing Thor like, you're not that strong. You don't have a hammer. And Thor's like, get out of here, man. I've kicked your butt so many times. Remember that crossover we had with Spider-Man? But anyway, uh, let's look at some of this beautiful Mike Del Moon. It's insane how different these three different artists are. Uh, just you know, Usually with a 
story that somebody is writing for such a long period of time, editors and writers try to find some artists that have a similar style and they keep the colorist the same because they want, you know, to make it a good reading experience. Like these three different artists have a same similar style. And I've seen that before. You've seen it when, uh, oh my gosh, when, when John Byrne left, I don't know why I went there, <laughs> West Coast Avengers, and Paul Ryan came over. It was like the inkers were told, I think it was Terry Austin, well, was told to ink Paul Ryan's inks and make it look like John Byrne's art. Um, and so you've seen that many times. But in this, it was like Jason Aaron and the editors were like, these are three different eras and three different types of stories. Let's pick some different artists that don't really resemble each other. I think that takes a lot of guts to do. And I think it worked because... You know, like I mentioned in my review, like I get used to a certain artist and then when somebody comes aboard, I'm like, ah, I already miss is that, dang it. And the same thing happens with this. I was like, oh, I miss Russell. Where is he going? Um, but this collects Thor 1 through 16 and then King Thor 1 through 4. So remember when I said complete is complete? Where's War of the Realms? So War of the Realms is not collected in here. The pages that have the War of the Realms type of stories, or let's go over here actually so we can look at them. Um, you get a little bit of a recap page is all you get. So something like this, previously in War of the Realms, and then you get to read the story as to what the next chapter is. Um, so for those people that have asked me, you know, what are the chances of a Thor Omnibus Volume 2 by Jason Aaron having War of the Realms? I, I say 90, what did I say last time I played it safe? I said 95%, just because of what we saw them do with Donny Cates' uh, Ben Omnibus. It has all of King and Black, the miniseries, and it has all of Absolute Carnage. But there's still that small percentage that they may not put it into the Omnibus because it's already been collected in its own Omnibus. It's got a trade, and it's not in here. So it just makes me a little... not. I don't know. I'm still sticking with 95%. Just because it's not in here doesn't mean that it won't be in the omnibus. Uh, but this book is huge. This book has 496 pages. It retails for $39.99. And if this is the way you've been reading it, you get Tony Harris's artwork in here, uh, Christian Ward's artwork, Mike Del Mundo, like I said. I'm going to show just a little bit of the final four stories because I don't want any spoilers for anybody. But you do have the return of Ezad Ribbage. In the last four issues of Thor or King Thor rather and this brings everything back this brings back um, the characters of young Thor which he's been doing for a while old Thor King Thor and even maybe a time display score makes an appearance but absolute beautiful artwork and there's a nice final issue in here to bring it all home and yeah oh Lee Garbett also does an issue in here too that so Mike Del Mundo could take a little bit of a break to go and focus on the War of the Realm issues. So look at that. That is gorgeous. That's from Thor 16. Mike Del Mundo. All right. Let's keep going with our very first epic for this week. And that is Ghost Rider. Finally, Volume 1. We've had Marvel Masterworks. We had Essentials. But the way that I read these was in 1990. I think it was 91, 92. Uh, they had this thing called like Ghost Rider Classics where they reprinted the original Ghost Rider, maybe it was called the original Ghost Rider, and the, the covers were new, but in the style of like classic X-Men or the uh, tells of Spider-Man, the Marvel tales, uh, the inside was identical to what was printed before. Pretty good way of uh, getting a monthly issue out there, and I bought a bunch of them. I think I bought them all the way to like issue 15, 16. Uh, but here are all your creators. Gary Friedrich, of course, co-creating the character of Ghost Rider. Tony Isabella, Roy Thomas, Marf Wolfman, Doug Mensch, Len Wein, Mike Plug, Tom Sutton, and Jim Mooney are the big names here. And kicking it off with Marvel Spotlight number 5. So this does collect Marvel Spotlight 5 through 12, Ghost Rider 1 through 11, and then Marvel Team Up number 15 which, of course, is the team-up with Spider-Man. In the very first issue, you get to see the origin of this character right here, Ghost Rider. He's a stuntman named Johnny Blaze. And Johnny Blaze is sitting here and reminiscing about his life, uh, how he lost his dad, Barton Blaze, 
uh, to an accident because he was also a daredevil. Uh, I guess they couldn't call this guy daredevil. And he's sitting here with his kind of new family. Uh, you have this guy named, what is his name? Crash Simpson. <laughs> Boy, that, that, you should have seen that coming, Crash. Um, his surrogate mother and his surrogate sister, Ro who he calls Rocky, but it's actually Roxanne. That was uh, one little weird thing in here is that he does develop some kind of little love story with his surrogate sister. But hey, this ain't Kentucky, so I guess that's okay. Um, so the story goes that, yeah, he loses his surrogate mother to a motorcycle accident. and She makes Johnny Blaze swear to never be a daredevil, to never go out there and ride a bike again. You have to promise to never ride on the show again because Crash has his own show. And Johnny's like, okay, I promise. But then Crash makes him feel guilty. He's like, dude, you got to do this. We are thrilling thousands of people, as the newspapers say. It's just me and Rocky out there. What are you doing? And then he lays the guilt trip even more when Crash says, um, so yeah, I got like 30 days to live. Doc says I'm dying. And Johnny's like, I can't, I can't do this. What am I going to do? So instead of like uh, breaking a promise to his surrogate mother, he would do what any adopted child would do and... That's go and open up the Satan Bible. <laughs> That's kind of... That, I forgot how this just kind of came out of nowhere. So he summons Satan. Because, you know... That's what you do. I don't think it even hinted at it. Other than the name Ghost Rider. That he was into the occult or anything. He just summons Satan. And Satan's like, what do you need? And of course, this is Satan. He's going to play a trick on Johnny. Johnny's like, look. I want my to you to cure my surrogate father. And he does. But then, of course, Crash ends up dying anyway. But the trade was he got Johnny's soul. And his soul becomes this host for this demon known as Sarathos. And the devil comes to get his due. So that's where Ghost Rider comes from. That is the origin of Ghost Rider, the spirit of vengeance. Now, later on, some of these things were retcon, of course. Like, was that actually satan or was it mephisto or was it another uh demon you do have the introduction here of damon hellstrom of course son of satan uh which woman appears through here but i did want to focus on the very uh origin of it because reading it like i think i read it last week and i stopped to read it to tell my wife man i had forgotten how uh different these were uh than the origin of danny ketch Forgot how dark it was, but just showcasing some more of this wonderful artwork in here. The book retails for $39.99, and it has 424 pages. Again, only has been collected in Marvel Masterworks and then the Essential Format, which were those big black and white books. And then here's Son of Satan, the way that you probably remember him looking. I didn't even get into the whole crash coming back to life as Curly and uh, fighting for the soul of his daughter. Anyway, you can read all about that stuff. Um, it seems like they were bouncing writers and artists at first until we get a f solid team for a while. And the team sticks around for a long time. Here is the Marvel team up number 15 with Spider-Man and Ghost Rider. Because that's what the team ups were. You had to put... Spider-Man teaming up with whomever the character you want to uh, get the word out on. The most supernatural superhero of all, Ghost Rider. There's the stunt master, the Devil's Disciple. Actually, you get the first few appearances of the Devil's Disciples in here. Here is the issue with the Hulk right here. This one's drawn by Sal Buscema. So you do get some great artwork in here. And then, of course, the extras in the back. Now, the extras are the only things I haven't looked at after reading this. Because there was a lot to read this week. Uh, so it looks like we have some original pages here. Hey, there's Curly. Mike Plug's pages. The Witch Woman character that was designed by John Romita, who was designing just about every character at that time at Marvel. Original Jim Mooney artwork. Gil Kane cover. John Romita cover. So probably a lot of the stuff that you've seen in the, the uh, Marvel Masterworks. The classic clips. What is this? Marvel Tales 254 reprinted Ghost Rider's first encounter with the orb. Oh, the orb does appear in here. Yeah, his first appearance is through these pages. The original orb. Um, 
classic clips. This is pinups. Marvel Tales. So this is the reprint of Spider-Man. So this would be the reprint of the Marvel uh, team up number 15. And then this is what I was getting. This is from 1992. Yes, it's coming out in 1992 and it was called the original Ghost Rider. I'm glad they kept them in here. I love these epics because they do things like that. They keep just everything that they can. Uh, so you have a new cover. Always love that Joe Quesada cover. But the inside is of the book is just exactly <laughs> what the original um, comic was. And this is how I read Ghost Rider. Because back then we didn't have trade paperbacks. That's Chris Bocciolo. Before he went over to do... He ended up doing Ghost Rider 2099, if I'm not mistaken. So that's issue number 15. Because they also collected the... Uh, Marvel Spotlight issues with Ghost Rider. And there's the issue with the Hulk from uh, Ghost Rider 11. So let's go ahead and keep going with our final book of the week. And that is the Incredible Hulk Epic Collection Crossroads. This is volume 13, 1984 to 1985. And this era is the Bill Mantlo era. So I'm was waiting for this. I think I told this story on my Saturday live stream, or maybe it was when I was doing my upcoming collected editions. I was waiting for this collection. I sold off my three Bill Mantlo trades because they were like the pre-epic trades. And I'm like, no, no, they're going to do these immediately. I say in two years time, we're going to have <laughs> two years time, man. Oh my gosh. When was it? Like five, six, seven years ago, maybe time just flies. Uh, so this collects the tail end of Bill Mantlo's era. It collects issues 297 to 313, Annual 13, and Alpha Flight 29. So, that's right. Bill Mantlo went over to Alpha Flight, and John Byrne left Alpha Flight to come here. It's like the editors did this thing where they were like, Hey, you guys bored writing your stories? Why don't you, you know, do a little switcheroo? That's exactly what happened. So, John Byrne went over to write and draw The Incredible Hulk. And Bill Mantlo went over to write Alpha Flight. And then he took Mike Mignola with him, who ends up um, finishing this book out. So you do have the artwork in here of Sal Buscema. And his art just looks so different than a lot of the art that I'm used to by him. Uh, because it's mainly of this inker right here, Jerry uh, Talaok, who inks his artwork. He also inks Mignola's artwork, and it has a very similar finish to it. So long story short, this is a very classic and very popular era of the Hulk. Because um, Bill Manlo does something here that was seems to have been popularized by the Illuminati and the uh, Planet Hulk storyline. But pretty much the exact same thing happened in the 80s. So Doctor Strange gets rid of the Hulk after he goes on a huge rampage. And he's like, yeah, I'm going to... Throw you into this thing, this dimension called the crossroads. And in the crossroads, it's like he bounces from different dimension to different dimension to um, find a place, to find the right dimension for him because he doesn't belong here. This is from the issue 300, which is phenomenally drawn, but this is the issue where it happens. So at the end of this issue is where we are introduced to this idea of the crossroads. So that's where the Hulk goes. And the next issue, that's where he is. Now, through the different dimensions, he does meet friends, but don't get too attached because, <laughs> well, it, nothing ends happy for Bruce Banner, the Hulk. Now, this is also a different era for the Hulk because during Bill Mantlo's run, the Hulk had been intelligent, but he was getting progressively well, dumber and dumber. Uh, so by the time you get here, he becomes a lot more savage. So when you got to issue 300, yeah, he was just full out savage. And that's why Dr. Strange and the heroes decided to poof, go to the crossroads. And in here, you get to find out what different dimensions he goes to. Does he fall in love with different people? Uh, does he team up? The UFOs do end up showing up in here. But not only that... The thing about Crossroads, though, and I, and I still feel this way after rereading this, is that it feels like he was rushed out of telling a story because Alpha Flight gets involved. And there's another story in here that I haven't talked about that also gets talked about quite often. Peter David explored it even more in his run. Um, 
And the idea is said to have come from Barry Winter Smith, which, of course, grew into that book that I talked about last year, Monster. Um, but that apparently was an idea by Barry Winter Smith, but Bill Mantlo uh, took that idea and wrote an issue about it. And that's in issue 312. By now, Mike Mignola is drawing this, believe it or not. That is Mike Mignola's artwork. Like I said, it's just the inks make it look like Sal Buscema's. But let's get to this because it, that this issue feels so out of place because, like I said, we're going through the crossroads. And then on top of that, it is a Secret Wars 2 tie-in, but it's a flashback issue. So Mike Mignola, Jerry Talog are the artists on this, and then Bill Mantlo writing the story. Uh, so this introduces a really unique idea about Bruce creating the persona of the Hulk in his childhood because of his abusive father. And you can read how this ends. You can read about his relationship with his mother. It's really heartbreaking. It's a really powerful issue. And like I said, one that a lot of writers borrowed heavily from. The pages all the way up until Immortal Hulk from Al Ewing. This is a very, if not the most important issue for the Incredible Hulk outside of his first appearance. Um, but, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a little heavy read. Not as heavy as Monster. If you've read Monster, you're good to read this. Of course, they had to follow the comics code. But all of this wraps up in the pages of Alpha Flight. So, like I said, it kind of felt like the editors rushed him out of the book so him and John Byrne could switch spots. Uh, the book retails for $44.99. It has 488 pages. And, yes, he took Mike Mignola with him to the pages of Alpha Flight. That's why we need an Alpha Flight Omnibus Volume 2. Let's look at the extras here. So, you have a Marvel Age, number 16. The drawing there of Sal Buscema. And what is this here? The oh, these are the corner boxes to the covers as he's doing a transformation. I used to love when they did that. I miss corner boxes. And let's see. Look out. Two of Marvel's top titles. I love looking at these with you all, so I never look at the extras. I just read the stories. And then when I do these overviews, I look at the extras. But try to go through here make sure there's no spoilers. John Burns and Incredible Hulk. And the new team in Action Alpha Fly from the creative team of Matt Lowe, Mignola, and Talal. Okay, so that's where it happened. So they apparently had planned it ahead to have these teams switch out. Uh, some reprints right here. This is what I had, the Crossroads trade paperback. This one here from 2013. And then I had the Regression uh, trade paperback. But that, as they say, is that. If you're interested in purchasing any of these books, don't forget to check out our sponsor, CheapGraphicNovels.com, your online home for graphic novels and collected editions up to 50% off cover price. They have excellent shipping and prompt and helpful service. Check out their bargain deals for up to 90% off cover price. And don't forget that CGN also takes pre-orders. That way you don't miss out on the hottest releases. And they are currently running a special promotion for you Minties. If you're a first time customer, after receiving your order confirmation email, reply back to that email and let them know Near Mint Condition sent you their way. They will then apply a free shipping promotional credit to your next order in the US. Cheap Graphic Novels, your source for the hottest books with the kind of deep discount, quality shipping, and customer service that will keep you coming back for more. And that was the content and page count of each of these trades. Let me know in the comments down below which ones you're picking up. Are you excited for that very first Ghost Rider Epic Collection? And finally, finally, after years of waiting, we have the Bill Mantlo era hitting the Marvel Epic line for the Hulk. And hopefully one day we'll get some Danny Ketch love in Epic format or in Omnibus format. So yeah, let me know down in the comments below what you are picking up, what you're most interested in, what you haven't read yet. And, of course, if you've read the stuff, let me know what you think about it. This was the Uncanny Omar. Thank you all so much for watching. Smash that like button, subscribe, ring that bell for notifications. Thank you so much to our patrons for making videos like this possible. And everyone, stay healthy and safe out there. Much love.